All right. Well, a special good morning to those who will be watching this later than Sunday morning. Uh, we miss you. We love you. And uh, if we don't even know you, please consider joining us if you live in central Wisconsin. Uh, where we're at this morning, we have been going through the Gospel of Luke, and we have uh, come to the passage of Scripture that talks about Jesus calling the first apostles, the 12 apostles. And um, as I explained last week, it's been my desire to kind of hit pause on this section and to give you guys an idea of the men that we are going to be kind of following through throughout the book of Luke. So uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, this is just kind of the refresh on the the men and their names. And then what we're going to be going this morning is looking specifically at the apostle Peter, whom you probably know the most about of any of the apostles that are mentioned So Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, in these days Jesus went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So, um, As we look at Peter, you know, we've kind of looked at these theme of being unexpected, unexpected, unexpected individuals, unexpected groups, unexpected things that are done. And um, as you think about the Apostle Peter today, there's really kind of one word that I want you to uh, think over and mull over in your mind when you consider this man's life. And it might be different than what you are used to when you think of the Apostle Peter. But I would encourage you to think about the word follower when it comes to Peter. And the reason why I hope will become evident over the next number of minutes, but it's because um, Jesus opens up his relationship with Peter by saying, follow me. And he closes his relationship with Peter um, in the Gospel of John by saying, follow me. And I think of, of all things that we can think about when it comes to Peter's life, of all the things we can think about when it comes to his ministry, for all the failures he had and all of the strengths and all of the, the, the successes, the thing that stands out to me is that Peter followed Jesus. Imperfectly, but he followed Jesus. And so in unexpected followers, what I'd kind of like you to think about with Peter, and we'll, we'll see why it was unexpected in a second. As for the big idea, the life and ministry of the Apostle Peter show how Jesus uses willing followers, again the word followers, to represent him in this world in the midst of their failure with the greatest patience and care. So we'll talk a little bit about Peter, we'll talk about his life, but then I I want us to kind of hone in on a few different things that we can take from his life that help us understand not only the way that God works through his people, but uh, the way that God himself shows himself, that he represents himself, that he, he reveals himself to us in the lives of these men and through us as well. So Jesus uses willing followers to represent him in this world in the midst of their failure with the greatest patience and care. That's what I think we can kind of distill from Peter's life as we think about it together. So Simon Peter, the follower of Jesus, Luke chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. We went over this a handful of weeks back as we looked at the calling of Peter, but we're going to go back here so that you get a... a a reminder of where this man came from. Luke chapter five, starting in verse one. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, now again, Simon, here is Peter, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So here's Peter. We're going to talk about his life again before we get to some lessons to be distilled from him. And uh, again, you probably know most about Peter when it comes to the different apostles. Maybe John rivals Peter in your mind for the kind of person that he was as you look through the gospel records. 
But there are some intentional phrases here that I want you to think about when you consider Peter's life. And we're going to start here with Peter was uneducated. Now, when I say uneducated, it doesn't mean that he couldn't read or write. That's not what I'm talking about. But when it comes to uneducated, you have Peter here. And Peter is a guy. He's just a guy. Um, now, we're going to contrast just a guy with the fact that you have all around you in this culture. It was a super religious culture. It was a culture in which people regularly attached themselves to religious teachers. The, the ruling atmosphere was an atmosphere in which people had uh, religious bent going at all times. Uh, even the Roman people had different gods, things that they would worship. That uh, is very, very... Um, I, I guess, telling about the environment in which they lived. You have people who are worshiping all the time. They are self-aware as a religious people. So Peter was an uneducated man in a religious setting. Peter did not have an education that would have seen him qualified or fit to be a spiritual leader. Now, Peter ends up taking on a significant role in the life of the church because Peter will become the man whom Jesus sets in the place of leadership over the other apostles. But to understand Peter right away is to understand this is not a man who had been trained by anything other than his following Jesus for the few years that Jesus had a public ministry on this earth. Peter was uneducated. Secondly, Peter was middle class. So when we looked at Peter a few weeks back and we looked at his calling, um, you should remember that Peter as a fisherman was not just a guy who went out to fish. Peter was a man who as a fisherman, this was a commercial job and he probably made a decent living. And as we looked at Jesus calling Peter, we looked at Jesus calling a man who actually had a livelihood that was worth something. And so as he's called to leave, he's called to leave a lifestyle that would have had some degree of comfortability, have some degree of security as a man who was a fisherman and providing commercial fishing enterprise to the surrounding community. So Peter was uneducated. He wasn't a religious leader by his training. He was middle class. He was married. And this is a surprise to some people. Uh, Peter has a mother-in-law that Jesus heals. We saw that back in Luke early on in the book that Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law and you don't get a mother-in-law without being married. So contrary to what some people might say in different traditions, Peter was married. He may have had kids, but the reality was we know for sure that he had a wife. So as Jesus calls Peter to leave his life, he's not calling him to leave his wife, but he is calling him to leave something that would have represented security for not only this man, but for the woman that he was married to. He was a Jewish man, as the other apostles were. They were Jewish ethnically and Jewish religiously. So Peter would have been a man who attended synagogue regularly. He would have been a man uh, who was a good church-going individual, though he was kind of a middle-class, hard-working guy. He was still a guy who went to church regularly. Think of kind of the, the regular run-of-the-mill individual you might find who goes to church in any neck of the woods that you find yourself. And then as to his person, his personality, um, we're going we're gonna to go through these lessons from Peter's life, but um, something that is striking when it comes to looking at Peter is that Peter was a man who had a tendency to speak and to act without really thinking it through. We don't have the time to go through all the different incidents where this is demonstrated, but there are multiple times where the, the different gospel authors show us a man who had an idea and went with that idea without consulting Jesus, who went with that idea without consulting anybody else and just decided I'm gonna go through with this and I think it's best. This was a man who was a leader. Peter was a man who by nature led. He was a man who by nature went out into the front and for better or worse, that's what he did. Now, God used this. God shaped Peter in his being a leader and being a man who took action, being a man who went out and took the charge. But the reality is that many times that got Peter in trouble. And as we think about the lessons from Peter's life, we're going to see how Jesus is really patient with Peter to refine him and to mature him, to make him a man who as a leader takes action but ends up becoming a man who learns the lessons that humility brings with it of saying that I need to think, discern, be wise with how I lead, how I act. So Peter was a man who acted without thinking much sometimes, spoke without thinking much. And then here's the thing that I want you to understand as we kind of look here again at the response that Simon Peter has. As, as he 
encounters Jesus, there is something that I, I believe we often get lost in the mix when we think about a man who spoke and acted without thinking it through. But I think from the very outset, as we encounter Peter, we see a man who has a genuine sense of humility. A genuine sense of humility. Because you see here, as he encounters Jesus, he says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. This is a unique statement when it comes to how the other disciples, how the other 12 encounter Jesus. Because some of them will have encounters with him where they're just kind of convinced, well, this is the Messiah. Others will have encounters where it's just, okay, I'm gonna go with you. But here, Peter uniquely demonstrates a humility as he recognizes his sinfulness in the presence of Jesus. And I think for us, it's important. And we'll see this in First Peter in just a little bit. But we'll see in just a little bit how Peter demonstrates in his life a man who knew his sin in the presence of God and who knew what his failure meant even as a follower of Christ. Because I think sometimes it's easy for us to just think about our failures before we came to know Christ and then to look at the successes we have after we come to know him. And yet in Peter's case, I think we see a man who not only knows humility coming from his failure before knowing Jesus, but I think he knows it really, really well afterwards. And there's something to be learned from that for us as well. So here are the lessons I want us to, to kind of take away from Peter's life. And we just see as we walk through this biography of Peter, how we can see Jesus at work and how we can see Peter as a demonstration of things that I hope you can connect to. So Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Then when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Now remember, the son of man is a term that Jesus used regularly to talk about himself. It's probably the most frequent term he used to talk about himself. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Now that means Simon, son of Jonah, Simon, son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And we'll talk about this passage really specifically in a second to kind of clear up some misconceptions. But I want you to see here that with all of his imperfections, Jesus chose to set apart Peter for the purpose of representing him in this world and trusting the leadership of the early church and patterning his confession of Christ for every believer to follow. So it's, it's common, especially if somebody's Roman Catholic background, to look at Matthew chapter 16 and to see here um, words on a page that somewhat represent a position that people take that Peter was the first pope, okay? People will, will come to this passage and they'll see um, Jesus saying, on this rock I will build my church and think, okay, well that seems to make sense if the pope, in Roman Catholic tradition, the pope is the successor of Peter and Peter is the first, uh, the rock in which the church is built and so all the popes that come after him are gonna be that same type of a thing, same type of authority belongs to them and that simply isn't the case because what we have going on here is you have Jesus setting apart Peter for a specific thing but for a specific reason. Jesus sets about Peter here. He sets apart Peter for the purpose of representing him in how he leads the church. And there are really two ways that he leads the church here. One, he leads the church in as much as he is called to lead the apostles. He is a man that will be set apart for the purpose of primarily preaching and teaching in the early church. And that's not something that we can diminish. It's not something to be diminished because we simply say, well, Peter is not the Pope. The reality is Jesus did set apart Peter for the purpose of leadership, but he didn't set apart the successor of Peter for leadership. What he did was he set apart this man so that he might provide leadership for the church, especially after Jesus left. And what should strike you about that is that as we get to know Peter, as we get to know who he is, we get to know his tendencies, you should be struck by the fact that Jesus is willing to make this statement about this guy. 
that Jesus is willing to say to this man, Peter, knowing all of his flaws in advance, knowing the things he would do in advance, that he's still willing to say, Peter, I'm going to build my church on your leadership. And secondly, I'm going to build it on your confession. And the reason why it's important for us to see here that, that there's a pattern that's set is because Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you or happy are you, Simon, son of John, because it isn't flesh and blood that's revealed to you the fact that I'm the Christ. This is the truth that is evident for every single Christian as we look at scripture. For every single person who truly confesses Jesus as the Christ, we do so not because we have come to a point of self-realization like, okay, well, I have decided this is the case about Jesus. The Apostle Paul says nobody can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. That means that for anybody to genuinely confess Christ, to genuinely profess faith in Jesus, it has to be something that works in that person by the Holy Spirit. And so as Jesus is speaking to Peter here and saying, I'm going to build my church on this rock, he's, he's also saying, now I'm going to build it on your leadership, I'm going to build it on your confession, Peter. Because your confession represents not somebody who has come to a conclusion themselves, but your confession represents somebody who has been given supernatural insight to understand really who Jesus is. Now, there's more that can be said about Peter's leadership and the power of the church to accomplish certain things, but for the point that we are kind of trying to get across this morning, it's important to see that Peter is a man that Jesus has determined will represent him as a leader, and that is a really, really astonishing fact. To think that the Lord of heaven and earth, perfect, infallible, should set apart a man to lead is a really remarkable thing. And it's remarkable as you think about any types of leadership that you might have in your family or in the church and you think about the fact that God would give you this responsibility and this charge knowing that you have faults and you have flaws just like Peter and yet he'd still choose you to represent him to other people. I think that's a humbling reality to consider that Jesus would set apart flawed human beings to represent him in this world. First Peter chapter 4 verses 12 through 16, letter written by the man Peter himself as he is much older. He says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, but that none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. The word Christian simply means little Christ. It's like a, a person who is a mirror of Jesus. And so as Peter is charging the church here for how it is that we're supposed to live, especially to live in situations of severe hardship, difficulty, suffering, persecution, Peter says to us, if you're going to suffer, suffer as a little Christ representing Jesus well. If you walk through this world filled with all the mess that it has in it, you're going to be put in positions as a follower of Jesus to suffer. And Peter says, guess what? You're called to represent Jesus well. As a little Christ, as a Christian, you're called to represent Jesus. Peter the failure. Um, maybe we're more familiar with Peter the failure than anything here. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. This is just after this confession that Peter makes, a confession that Jesus builds the church on. The man, Peter, whom Jesus entrusts with leadership and builds the church on in that leadership. Matthew 16, 21 through 23, right after this, here's what we find. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day he be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So though he was a leader of the apostles, Peter's faults and failures are not only not ignored, but highlighted. 
in order to demonstrate that even those God chooses to lead are only men in need of grace themselves. It, it has to be, I mean, we, we can't look at Matthew's writing of his record of Peter's life and ministry as anything other than this is an intentional God-inspired moment for him to go right from this high moment of confession to this moment of just seems to bottom out where Jesus, who entrusts him with his leadership, calls him Satan right away. We don't know how many days would have passed between this kind of mountaintop confession that Peter makes and this moment where Jesus rebukes him because Peter rebuked Jesus. But what we do know is that as Matthew records this, there is an intentional effort on the part of God Almighty in inspiring the text to say that Peter, in a moment of great glory, is also a man who in lurking in his heart has the same tendency to say really dumb, stupid things. He can confess great things and he can also make terrible mistakes, terrible failures. And as we look at Peter's life throughout the gospel records, we see this again and again. It is highlighted. And I would suggest to you that it is important that we see throughout scripture that the flaws of the most significant people in the history of God's people, their flaws are highlighted regularly. There are few exceptions to this rule. Some of the most significant people in the history of redemption, whether it's Abraham, whether it's Noah, whether it's David, whether it's Jacob, whether it is Peter, it doesn't matter. We go through the list and you find time and time again, the authors of scripture are really quick to point out flaws and that's not so that we can throw them under the bus. It's so that we can recognize that the flaws and failures of these men are there for us to understand that it is not their heroism, it is not them being a savior, but it is the fact that God works through them as flawed people that we can look at and appreciate and be thankful and see that God works through them and is willing to work through us as well. Here are some other incidents that I want you to think about when it comes to Peter's failure and how you might be able to identify with him and some of the things that he said and did that you might feel particularly disqualified to represent Jesus with. In Matthew chapter 14, this is uh, after the feeding of the multitudes by Jesus. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. So here's a failure on Jesus' part that perhaps, or on Peter's part that perhaps you identify with when it comes to how you relate to Jesus. I will hear frequently from people saying things to the effect of, I don't know if I really believe strongly enough the things that the Bible says. How could this be true? How, and, and people ask these types of questions about, okay, I see this stuff, but I, I can't see it. I can read it, but I can't see it. I can read it, but I don't know that I can trust it. And I want you to think about Peter here. And here's a guy who has experienced miracle after miracle in Jesus' public ministry, and yet he goes out and he's actually saying, command me, Jesus, to come to you. So here's a man who has followed Jesus and he's actually asking Jesus to command him to follow him. So he goes out and yet he experiences a moment where he doubts. And there's a kindness, and we'll look at the kindness of Jesus toward Peter and how that, how that works in our hearts in just a little while. But I just want to highlight this right now as we think about this and Peter's unbelief is that Jesus, he, he calls him to this moment a pretty glorious moment. This is the only record we have of another human being walking on water in the history of the world. You have the eternal son of God who does it, and then you have Peter who does it. 
and he goes out and then there's a moment where he comes to Jesus and he looks around and he's like, oh crud, and he starts sinking in the water. And the reason, because of unbelief. And I would suggest to you that every single one of us, as we think about our relationship with Jesus, if we are honest with ourselves, deal with unbelief. That we will hear Jesus say certain things and in the back of our mind we'll think, that sounds really good, Jesus, and I think I can trust you to a point, but there's a certain point where I can't trust you. There's like this point of no return of belief to unbelief and and we get to that spot and then we start kind of kicking in with our own efforts. We start kicking in with our own sense of this is how it should work and, and I, I can't trust, I can't trust. And in Peter's life, you see this happen. And then look at Jesus' response to Peter. He says to Peter, oh, you of little faith. And I wanna suggest to you that is not because, that is not because Jesus is saying, Peter, you idiot, what are you doing? This term, you of little faith, it's almost like a term of endearment where Jesus says to Peter, you, little faith, what's going on? That's how Jesus relates to us in our unbelief. If you're genuinely following Jesus, when you deal with unbelief and you're genuinely struggling with it, you're wanting to obey, you're wanting to follow, Peter Peter represents for us the type of individual that Jesus comes to and says, I know you're struggling with this, but you need to trust me. Peter fails at this point, and yet we see Jesus working in and through him. Probably the most significant failure in Peter's entire life, one that we are well familiar with if you know the Bible to any degree. Matthew 26, verses 30 through 35. As Jesus is having the Last Supper, they're preparing to go to the point where he is crucified. It says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Here's how Luke records this, a little bit more specificity in the conversation. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And here's the record of that. Luke twenty two fifty four through 62. Then they seized him and led him away, seized Jesus, led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they'd kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But Peter denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is probably the most extreme example that you're gonna find in the entire Bible of somebody who's a genuine follower of Jesus doing something that is dishonoring to God. There are a whole host of things that people who are genuine followers of Christ might struggle with when it comes to sin. But man, in the list of things that I think I would never do this, this has gotta be in the top of my list. You know, I could see myself falling into different temptations and sins, but this is one I think, man, there's no way in the entire world I could ever, ever, ever deny Jesus. I could ever, ever disown Jesus. And Peter does it three times in one night when Jesus needed him the most. This was a terrible, terrible, terrible failure on the part of a man who literally just a few hours had said, I'm never gonna do what I'm about to do. 
And Jesus had even warned Peter, saying that Satan himself had demanded to have him and to just sift him like wheat. It means just like thresh him apart. Jesus knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's doing. And he tells Peter this is going to happen. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. It's not the first time, by the way, that Jesus has met that resistance from Peter. But what we see here in Peter's disowning of Jesus, publicly disowning Jesus, is one of the most terrible failures that's ever existed in the Bible. And I wonder when you think about your Christian experience, if there is something that is kind of lurking in the back of your mind where you think, I know I couldn't be brave enough in the future, or I know that there's something in my past that has been so disqualifying that in order for me to represent Jesus well, if somebody were to know that this happened to me or happened through me or happened by me, there is no way in the world that anything good can come from it. To be very clear, there are certain things that will disqualify a person from public ministry. Okay. That being said, there's a graciousness that exists here when it comes to Jesus' relationship with Peter that we're going to see in just a minute that show that God is more than willing and he regularly uses people who make really bad decisions to make good decisions in the future. And I want you to rest assured as we go forward here and as we look at Jesus' relationship with Peter I want you to rest assured that God is able and willing to use you no matter what has happened in your life. We all carry different things, different areas of shame, different areas of guilt, different things that you feel like this is just terrible. Nobody else knows what it feels like. And that might be true to a degree, but Jesus knows. And the Jesus who is willing to work through people like us, this is how we see him displayed. Again, going back to Luke 22. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Now I want you to focus here specifically on what Jesus says to Peter when he says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. I want you to think about that as we go here. In Peter's failure, we meet Jesus as the one who does not give up on those whom he has truly called to himself, but patiently matures and grows them until they become the people they were purchased to be. So I use the word purchase here specifically because when we think about the work of Jesus, we don't simply think about Jesus saying to people, hey, guess what? Come to me and join my club. That's not what happens. The work of Jesus on the cross was the work to purchase people. It was to pay the price to ransom people, to rescue them for himself so that we might belong to him. And so when you think about Peter here, you have to think this is a guy who has been purchased. This is a guy who has been purchased. His life has been purchased. So a man who has a history of failures, not only in the past, but who would have a history of failures in the future, Jesus has purchased him. And I want you to be convinced of this, that in Peter's failure, as we think about his life, we meet Jesus as the one who does not give up on those whom he has truly called to himself. And I just have to emphasize that. Jesus does not give up on his people. Now, to be sure, there are plenty of people, and it is sad, it is heartbreaking, there are plenty of people who will make a profession of faith in Jesus, but it's not genuine because, as Jesus said to Peter earlier on, saying, it is not flesh and blood has revealed this to you, but it is my Father who has revealed it to you, it's the Holy Spirit who has revealed this to your heart. Plenty of people make professions of faith in Jesus that aren't necessarily spirit-given professions of faith. A lot of people can say, Jesus... I like what you give. Jesus, I see that you seem to be a good teacher and so I like you and that kind of a thing, but that's not the type of profession we're talking. We're talking about the same type of genuine profession that Peter makes, a confession of faith that is given by the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know this, that God does not give up on his people who are truly his, even if you do some stupid things. Here's how Jesus responds to Peter's failure. After Jesus is crucified, after Jesus is raised from the dead, in John chapter 21, we find this account. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. 
Simon Peter, Simon Peter, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. Now, I want you to consider here, when he's saying, I'm going fishing, this doesn't mean he's going to get a rod and reel and go sit on the shore. This means he's going to go back to his old life. Peter is saying, this was all well and good for the past two years, but now it's over. And I don't think it's simply because he's saying it's over because Jesus is dead and whatever. I think he's saying it's over because of the guilt that he feels over what he did by denying Jesus. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Now this should sound familiar to you if you think about Jesus calling Peter the first time. Peter had been out fishing, didn't catch anything. And Jesus comes to Peter to meet him and says, put your net over the side of the boat. And Peter's response in seeing this great catch of fish was, Lord, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. So bear that in mind as this continues on. They cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now this disciple was John. This is John, the son of Zebedee. He was there at this initial catch of fish back in Luke chapter five. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, pretty specific number. Although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, to, to provide some perspective here, there are a couple of different ways that we can understand him saying, do you love me more than these, okay? And I don't know that there is clear a clear answer as to what these necessarily means, but there are really two options for us here. And both of them, I think, are helpful for us to understand what's being asked. One is, do you love me more than these other disciples do? Do you love me more than these? The other option is, do you love me more than these, meaning this life that you are trying to go back to right now? Do you love me more than either of these? And in either case, he's saying, am I the greatest priority in your life? Am I the top priority for you? Do you love me more than any of this? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So just as Peter denied Jesus publicly three times, so Peter comes to Jesus in this moment. He's coming back on shore. He's got his garments on. He was working. He comes to Jesus, is excited, has breakfast with him. And then Jesus says three times to him, will you own me, Peter? Will you own me? Do you love me more than all of this? And even though Peter is grieved and he weeps, there is still something very precious about this moment because Jesus is showing him a kindness to say, even though you've failed massively, I'm still interested in you. Now Jesus continues by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? 
Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So again, there's this bookend that occurs. Jesus encounters Peter on a boat, didn't catch any fish, tells him to throw his net, catches a bunch of fish. Peter is overwhelmed by his sense of sin and guilt, comes to Jesus, and Jesus comforts him and says, follow me. The exact same thing happens here at the end of John. It's not a coincidence in any way. And as you think about your own story, you think about your own relationship to Jesus, just think there is poetry in it, the fact that Jesus intends to relate to you a certain way. He knows you, he knows what goes on in your heart, he knows your failures, he knows your weaknesses, and he's willing to address you in those, not with an attitude of condemnation, but an attitude of kindness and compassion, saying even in your failure, I am willing to have you whether it's at the first moment of you coming to know him or after your worst moment as a Christian, Jesus will have you. But the key here is in all of this, you have to follow him. That's what separates Peter from Judas. What separates Peter from Judas is that Peter is grieved with his sin. Judas makes excuses. Judas made the decision to do what he did and he made excuses and rationalized it and said, you know what? Yeah, this might be wrong, but here are the good reasons why I can do it. And Peter makes a bad decision, makes few bad decisions, and he comes to his senses and says, this was a terrible decision. There was no reason for me to do it whatsoever. That's the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. And Peter demonstrates for us godly sorrow because he recognizes what it is as a man to follow Jesus. And it's not to be perfect. It's that you're striving to honor God with your life. And when you blow it, when you screw up, you're willing to come to terms with it and say, I failed and I failed my Lord, but I know he'll have me if I come to him and follow him. That's what sets Peter apart from Judas that God and his sovereign will, his sovereign grace has given him a heart that is willing to look at his sin and say, yeah, this is wrong. And I need to go forward. I'm gonna close here with a mature statement from Peter. Years after this, so you can see the maturity that he gained because of a faithful and a patient savior. As he's bringing this letter to a close in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility, toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Interesting words from a man who was very proud. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Let's think of the words that Jesus spoke to, to Peter when he said Satan demanded to have him. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is who Peter came to know Jesus as after spending a few years with him, walking with him, failing him, doing things that seemed really, really outstanding at times and doing other things that were terrible. He came to know that Jesus is the one who is willing to keep his people and to give them the grace of perseverance to continue to go through a hard world so that at the very end, it is God himself who will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. This This is who Peter represents Jesus to be, is Jesus is one who is patient and kind toward his people. And I want you to know Jesus as that this morning. As you think about Peter's life, I want you to think about a man who represents your failures and your successes and victories as a Christian and to think that through all of it, Jesus is patient and loves you just the same. So the worship team wants to come on up. I'm gonna pray for us and we'll finish out our morning in song. Jesus, we confess that we fail you more often than we realize. 
and we fail you in terrible ways at times, and yet you are a patient Savior because you're a Savior. You're not one who champions all of our successes, but you're one who saves us out of our weakness and our sin, and I pray that you would please cause us to know you as that, as a Savior who loves us in our failures. I pray that you would use us and strengthen us as you did Peter so that we might glorify you in the midst of those and in the successes and the victories that we have, that in all of it, you might be the one who is glorified. As we finish in song, Lord, I pray that you would please bless our moments here as we sing, thinking upon you. We ask, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.